We read together to remind us of where we are going. That is towards Jesus. Allowing the scriptures, the Holy Spirit, and the family of God to form a fidelity of allegiance to him alone. Please read aloud with me as we confess this together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, global, and apostolic church. We believe in the forgiveness of sins proclaimed in water baptism. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Welcome to Faith Church. Glad you're in the room and online. Again, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Matthew. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, we've been in a collection of messages talking about our mindsets. Come on, somebody say, Mindset Matters. And uh, we're kind of looking at a 2.0 version of our mindsets, kind of a, a renewal of some language. We've, re, we've reworked them. We have five mindsets as a church. And in fact, I want to say these mindsets together this morning as we get started. Uh, would you say this at me? We say, we are rooted. Come on, nice and strong. We are for people. We are together. We are focused. We are advancing. Today, I want to look at this third mindset that we are together. We are together being unified as God-honoring, joyful, generous, humble contributors. We are together. We are together. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. We start in verse 1, and then we're going to kind of unpack some of these things. What does it mean to be together? And uh, now I know many of you, some of you are, are brand new to Faith Church. You're kind of just new around here, and, and I'm glad you're coming along. Uh, you, you collected, uh, decided a great Sunday to kind of be a part. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the family of God and this local body, this church, Faith Church. And it's kind of what we're doing kind of at the beginning of this year anyway. So some of you are watching online, and this is your church, and you're here, and you're, you're part. This is going to be a great kind of solidify in your heart. Some of you are kind of new and kind of examining and looking. This is going to be a great uh, message for you, too, because it's going to really help you uh, assess and determine kind of, man, is this the family that God is placing me into? I, I believe there's something powerful that happens when we recognize God leading us to be planted in a local body, in a family, in a congregation, in a church. Something beautiful that happens in our life, some flourishing that takes place simply because we are planted in the right environment that God would have us be planted in. And uh, many of you have experienced that and you're a testimony of that very thing and I'm grateful for it. And many of you are just kind of learning and growing into that and I'm really glad that you are here for it. Uh, Ephesians 2, starting at verse 1, this is what the apostle says. He says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you fit into the category of many sins, because we all fit into the category of many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. <laughs> He is 
the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. So, in other words, whether you recognize it or not, we all at once lived, controlled, and, and kind of under the spell of sin, occupying and, and leading us in the direction of the devil, the enemy of our souls. That's what the apostle just said. Whether you realize it or not, we were all once spellbound by sin. And then he says, all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and the inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. Here's, here's one of the greatest words in all of scripture, but. Pivot. New thought. That may be true, but something else is more true. But. God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united now with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as an example of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus you are a walking billboard to the wealth of God's goodness if you put your faith in Jesus and you've received the life of Christ and you know that you have put your faith in him and you've entered those waters of baptism that we were just talking about the importance of water baptism because it celebrates the 2.0 you there was a 1.0 version of you that was corrupt in your programming under the spellbound of sin. And when you repent and realize it, awaken to the love of God in your life, repent, receive Jesus, you now get an upgraded operating system, a 2.0 operating system like Christ. And that's what we celebrate in the waters of baptism. We are burying the old operating system and being raised to new life, celebrating a 2.0 work of the Spirit, new in Christ Jesus. That's a reason to say, amen. Like That's what we do. That's what we celebrate, and that's why we do baptism, and that's why you should be water baptized. He goes on to say in verse 8, God saved you by his grace when you believe. What word version says, for by grace you have been saved through your faith. And you can't take credit for this. It's an absolute gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things he's planned for us long ago. Skip down to verse 19. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. No, what, what is he saying? You are now citizens along with all God's holy people. You are members of God's family. You're a member of God's family. Together, somebody say together. Together, we are his house built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together. Somebody say together. In him, becoming a holy people for the Lord. Becoming a holy people for the Lord. You are saved by grace through your faith. Your faith is not just this understanding or a belief system or a feeling that you have you're like oh yeah, yeah i kind of like that jesus guy or yeah, yeah, yeah i kind of want to go to heaven and not hell faith and believing is linked to a broader understanding of something it begins with an understanding where we accept the truth of who jesus is and who we are he was perfect we are not he is the savior we were sinners when we accept that truth, the acceptance of that truth moves us into a pursuit, into an allegiance, into a faithfulness and a commitment that we rally around. Let me say it like this. There was a moment where I was awakened to the reality that it was not good that Matthew was alone. He needed.
needed someone better to come alongside and be his partner in life. And so I was awakened to the beauty of Amber Renee Dare. I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble for using her middle name or not, but here we go. I was awakened to her beauty, and I said, I want to accept and I believe that she is the woman for me, and I want to marry that woman. And then I just pursued my own thing, did my own life, and just assumed that we'd all live happily ever after in the sweet by and by. Is that what happened? No. There was a belief and a truth that I accepted and I recognized, and I chose as an act of my will to now pursue this beautiful woman until she wore herself down to say, yes, I will. Come on. You, there was a pursuit that was accompanied by this thing that I had a belief about. There is a belief that rises and awakens within our hearts that says, I need a savior. Jesus is the only way to God. I am a sinner and I need his grace to come and rescue me. I need his spirit to work in my life so that I can move in his direction. And I don't just claim something that I believe something and then sit still until it happens one day when I die. No, I believe something, hold on to something, and I now pursue him with my life. Faith without work, scripture says, is absolutely futile and pointless and dead. But it's not our works that save us. It wasn't my pursuit that won it. There was something that happened in my heart and her heart that allowed that to happen. There's something that happens. God's heart towards you is already open and full of love towards you. And when you accept his love in your life and you repent of your sins, you redeem. And he redeems you. He saves you. He, he, he begins to forgive you. He justifies you. He, he rescues you. And as a result, there is something that propels you and moves you forward in a faithful fidelity and relationship to your God. This is the salvation work in our lives. It's not because I do good deeds that I get to heaven. In other words, if you're hoping that your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds one day and you logged in enough church miles to make it to heaven, you're going to be sadly disappointed. It's an understanding that my heart has now surrendered my, led me to a place where I believe something deep in my heart. I've accepted him as, as the Lord. I now am giving my life in surrender and submission to follow after him. This is what it looks like to faith, have faith and believe something. That it's something that I accept, I recognize, my mind has changed to it. I, I, I recognize that his spirit is working and there's a grace that's happening in my life. And as a result, I'm now moving in his direction. I'm now pursuing him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm now loving him and serving him and giving him lordship in my life where his will calls the shots in my life, not my will. And one of the beautiful things that happens, he says, is that he brings us in, saves us, renews us, changes us, adopts us, and places us in his family. Places us in his family. We, we believe in one holy, global, apostolic church. That there is a global understanding of individuals who have surrendered their own life and experienced the saving grace of the Lord that have been adopted, selected, and placed in God's family. It's called the church. And globally, there is a church, and locally, there are expressions of that same body and family and church. It's a global thing that also expresses itself locally. And locally, it is expressed individually as we recognize that we are placed into the family of God. Together. Somebody say, together. We've been placed in this together. We've been placed in this together. And and he says that you, when you experience the saving goodness and the grace of God, that we understand then that the reason we are saved is because 
He, he saves us and he places us among a people. And as he places us among a people, that people is now understood to be a masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Let me look back, if you've got it, uh, Ephesians 2, go back to verse 10. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good thing he has planned for us long ago. We read that so many times. And for many of you who've kind of grown up in the church, you've kind of grown up in this environment, you've gone to church your whole life, you probably have memorized or heard this scripture and, and somebody has said to you, hey, listen, you need to know that you are the masterpiece of God. And, and I believe that Psalms 139 says that we were fearfully and wonderfully made, that God knit us together in our mother's womb, that, that life begins at the moment of conception. I believe all of those things, and there is within you personally, individually, the fingerprint and the life, the life flow of God himself. There is something beautiful and wonderful about who you are. But you are not the masterpiece being referenced in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Does it say for you are God's masterpiece? Is that what it says? What does it say? Look back at it. It says for, what does it say? For, for we are God's masterpiece. See, many of us, I've got this puzzle box right here. Look at this beautiful artwork of this puzzle. It's uh, right on my level, only 300 pieces. I have the attention span to put together a 300-piece jigsaw puzzle. 3,000, no thank you. Right, like that's that's not my jam. Some of you, you're like, give 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 me a ten thousand piece puzzle. I don't even know if they make that, but boy, that sounds like torture. Uh, but it's a beautiful box. I love this picture. It's really colorful. It's beautiful. It's there. This is a bit of a masterpiece, and I want us to understand that this box, this picture of a masterpiece of a puzzle put together. When it's all completed, creates a picture that is beautiful, that says something, it makes a statement, it reveals some things. I want us to use this as an image or as a metaphor for the local church today. This represents the local church. <laughs> and if this is the masterpiece that God is creating to tell his story, to reveal something beautiful and wonderful, if this is the masterpiece created and predestined and designed for good works, then there is something that God has for this local body that is beautiful and wonderful. There's a mission that we are on. There's an assignment that we have in this house. As part of the global body and expression of Jesus, there is a local understanding that there is something that God has called us to and a way in which we go about doing those things. Friends, you are not the masterpiece. You are just a piece of the masterpiece. Turn to your neighbor and say, hey, you're a piece. Not a piece of work. You're just a piece. Come on, just you don't have to give them an insult. You're, you're just a piece. You are a piece. I am just a piece of the masterpiece that God has for us. I, I'm just a, a piece. You're just a piece. There, there is a part that we are called to. L look at, again, the language in Ephesians 2, 19 through 20. With this in mind, it says, So now you Gentiles, or those of you outside of the faith, or the covenant of God, are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house being built, put together the foundation, on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets or the teachings of, of what we have in Scripture. The cornerstone is Jesus Christ himself. And we are carefully being joined, linked up, placed in a spot together in him, becoming something holy of a temple for the Lord, for the Lord's presence, for his dwelling, for his spirit to flow in and flow through. You were saved not just for heaven. You were saved to be a piece of a people. You were saved to be a part of a family. Part of your redemptive purpose is to fulfill a role in the family and the community of God. For his grace was given to you for that reason. If, go to um, Ephesians chapter 3. Look at how it says it starting in verse 8. It says, though I am the least deserving of all God's people, I think we can, many of us would put ourselves in that phrase, 
He graciously gave us the privilege of telling others about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the very beginning. God's purpose in all of this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ our Lord. Can I just give us a sidebar for those of you that have been walking with Jesus for a long time? You've been a part of the church. You've grown up in your faith. Can I I just let you know? Your participation within the body of Christ is spiritual warfare. Part of the strength of the victory that we experience of removing and demolishing and taking strongholds and places and territory that has belonged to the enemy that we take back, part of that happens when we recognize that we have a part to play in a body. Because within the body, when we fit into the family and we find the peace that we were designed to play and the peace where we fit within the body in ways in which we can contribute. When we find ourselves in that place, there is something that God begins to break through and do. There's something that happens. It is revealing the wisdom. Uh, One version says of, of verse 10 that it is the manifold wisdom of God being expressed through the body, the church. To all of the unseen realms, there is something that is testifying of the power of God beyond what you can see in this moment in time. Tangent over, let's get back to the text and our whole point. That was free, by the way. No, no extra charge for that. That was good, though, and great places to say amen. What does all this mean, pastor? We're puzzle pieces. Are you, what, what kind of piece of what? I'm a piece of, like, like I know, like, like, let me break this down for us a little bit more because here's what we're talking about today. We're talking about this mindset that we have as a church that we are together being unified in as God-honoring, joyful, generous, humble contributors. Let me say it another way. We are together, unified as contributors who are on a mission. This family, belonging to the family, this local body, being a part of this church, being placed in this place, is, is where we want to be together, unified as contributors on this mission that God has for us. Some of you might be sitting there thinking, like, okay, like, what does that mean? What do you mean as a contributor? Well, I think it looks a couple ways. Number one, when we contribute to the family of God, there are relational connections that we foster. There are relationships that we foster. And there are responsibilities that we carry. There are relationships that we cultivate. And there are responsibilities that we carry on our own. It might look like engaging in things like growth track so that you can gain some traction into this body, into this family, and move forward. First Sunday, second Sunday, third Sunday, growth track one, two, and three. If you've not taken growth track, maybe it's time to jump in and begin to do that this year. It looks like being a part of a group, a connect group. Those are going to launch here in a couple weeks, getting in a group. It looks like serving on a serve team. It looks like giving regularly of financial contribution to the things that God is doing. It looks like showing up on first Wednesday to pray together. It looks like being here regularly to worship and to sing and allow my voice to be heard as we together declare the anthems of our faith, Jesus, over everything. You reign above it all. These lyrics that we sing aren't just picked out because they sound good and got a beat and make you sing it all week long. We select these songs and and put them in rotation because they are foundational and faith formational. We are singing anthems of what we believe and are moving towards. They're anthems of our love for our God and our King. My my goal today, and it's going to be a bit of a strong word from here on out. There's going to be some strong things that I say. Because I want you to understand you were saved not to be an individual who makes it to heaven. You were saved because God wanted to put you as a piece 
in a family that is presenting and declaring the mission of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, in a world that desperately needs to have darkness pushed back by the light of Jesus. You're a peace. And for some of you, you're a peace that is missing. And when I talk about today that we want to be together, being united as contributors, I'm talking about engaging and serving and being a part of, of the life of the family and the body that God has placed you in. Now, if this is not your church, if you've just kind of been checking it, you've visited a few times, listen, you, you are off the hook, able to say amen real loud today, like zero, like it, it, it is, it is guilt-free, zero calories for you, right? Like just some information that'll be good for you. But if you've been around Faith Church for longer than, let's say, three months, I'm wanting to remind us of who God has called us to be, that we are together being unified as contributors on this mission. This is what we are called to do, to, to contribute in these areas, to contribute not just our time, to contribute our, our, our talents and our gifts and our skills, to, to be a part of the family. But now, we are in a, a bit of a rebuild process as a church, without a doubt. Two years, COVID, walked through a lot of things, but this is a year where we're just saying, you know what? We're going to experience renewal around some of the key things that God has for us. It's, it's a 2.0 year for us. Flipping the switch and, and re-allowing our, we're, we're kind of changing the operating system a little bit of our minds. And it's starting with our mindset this year. And one of those is that we are together being unified. as God-honoring, joyful, generous, humble contributors and it's not that we are just contributors. It's not that we just want to give or that we want to be a part of Growth Track or that we want to show up on Sundays and, and, and worship and engage and be a part of the family and get to know the people around us rather than just sitting by ourselves all the time or not knowing somebody's name. It's, it's more than just, it's the relational connection that we're cultivating as well as the responsibility that we carry as we give, as we serve, as we participate in, in 21 days of prayer and all of the things, the life of the church that we would contribute and be a part of. It's not just that we do that, but there are certain attributes of how we go about doing that that are specific for us as well. And that's really what I want to unpack over the next nine minutes or so. N number one, it's this, that one of our attributes as contributors is that we are, number one, God honoring. Somebody say God honoring. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, says this. With the Lord's authority, I say this. Live no longer as the Gentiles do. In other words, don't live as unbelieving pagans do. For they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness and they wander far from the life God gives them because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. Every kind. The kind that you're comfortable talking about in church and the kind that you hope nobody ever talks about in church. Verse 20 says, Here's that beautiful word in the Bible again. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature, that 1.0 programming. Throw that off and get that 2.0 beautiful stuff going again. You have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him. Throw off your old sinful nature and your former ways of life, which is corrupt by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Your life and my life, as we contribute to the family of God, how do we live among each other as, as, as a peace? of God's masterpiece, one of the things that he's calling us as faith church to do is to commit our lives to be God honoring, to put on Jesus in every aspect of our life. The things that we delete in our web browser and the things that we post on social media, God honoring. The ways that we talk to one another 
and talk about one another. God honoring. It is a call to this holy life. And the beautiful thing is it's his spirit at work in you who lived, gives you the power to live the holy life anyways. It's his power that's helping you do it. You just have to submit and yield to it. Galatians says when you walk in step with the spirit, you won't fulfill the desires of your flesh. That's one of the reasons why we're on a fast for 21 days. We are saying no to our flesh that wants something and saying, nah, -uh, not today, flesh. You're not in control. So that we can say yes to something that is much, much better. Life and the spirit and the ways of God. To allow that to grow in us. He says to put on God's ways. We live in a unique season and time in our life. What most kind of philosophers and sociologists and, and theologians would say, and, and I would agree, that we are living in the, a time in the West, here in America, in what is considered a post-Christian society. It is post-Christian. Author Mark Sayers describes it like this. He says, a post-Christian culture attempts to retain the solace of faith whilst gutting it off the costs of commitment and restraints that the gospel places upon the individual will. Post-Christianity intuitively yearns for the justice and the shalom of the kingdom whilst defending the reign of the individual will. In other words, here's what we say. Jesus, would you heal me? And then we go do whatever the heck we want with our bodies. Jesus, would you forgive me? I ain't forgiven them, not one, not, uh, not until they apologize and they grovel and they repay it all back. God, would you answer my prayer? I promise if the Chiefs win tonight, I'll be at church every Sunday. Like we, we want the benefit of the kingdom of God without the commitment and the sacrifice and the fidelity of our faith to say I'm going to live God's way. We don't get to have our cake and eat it too. If we're going to be a, together, God honoring, we have to be willing to examine every area and attitude of our life and say, is this God honoring or is this something that is selfish of me and how I want to do it? How I want to live my life, how I want to do my family time, how I want to prioritize my schedule how I want to go about doing things. We want to be God-honoring, which means God gets to be in control. We put on Christ, not put on ourselves. And we do it his way, not our way. We want to be God-honoring. It's one of our attributes. We want to be joyful. Somebody say joyful. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25 says this. Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. One version says that anger creates a stronghold of the devil in your life. A strong, in other words, he has control and a grip on your life. Stronghold. The reason many of us respond in anger, don't miss this. The reason many of us respond in anger is often because we feel like we have lost control, which is an illusion anyways. We feel like we've lost control of something, so we respond in anger. But the reason we feel like I lost control in that moment, it's un underneath the anger. Can I tell you what's really driving it? A spirit of fear. The Bible says, Perfect love casts out all fear. In other words, the, when you understand and are rooted in the love of God, you have no problem trusting and releasing control to God. But when you allow the love of God to rule and reign in your heart, you're not operating in fear. You're operating in, in God's love. The moment that we allow fear to rule and reign in our heart, we feel out of control and we're grasping and we're afraid, and so we don't know what else to do, so we just get angry. And you know what happens in our anger? It creates a strong grip of the enemy in our life. 
And the cycle continues. Because he's the author of fear. He is the spirit of fear. The Bible says, in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength, Scripture says. You either are walking in the strength of God's love in your life, or you are walking gripped by a stronghold of fear in your life. And the evidence of what is gripping you or strengthening you is whether or not you are getting angry or getting joyful. Friends, sometimes, not sometimes, I want to challenge all of us. When you get in God's presence as a sacrifice, when you lift your hands and you sing out loud, and you begin to praise God as an act of your will and your faith of allegiance and fidelity to Him and His ways, the presence of God shows up in your life and there is a strength and a joy that comes. Joy gives you strength. The presence of God gives you joy. So the more presence of God that you have in your life, the more joy you can have in your life, the more strength you have in your life to fulfill the things that God has called you to do. I think it's high time we stop letting fear and anger be our MO and we get back to the presence of God, the love of God, and allow joy to be our way in which we go about our lives. Not anger, joy, joy. Allowing the love of God to be poured out in our hearts. We want to be joyful, God-honoring, joyful, generous, generous. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. No, verse 28. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work. Then give generously to others in need. We, we want to be generous. We want to give generously together, unified in our generosity. There's something beautiful that happens when we make a decision to be consistent in our giving. If you are not consistent in your giving to the Lord through the local church, can I just challenge you? Take a step in that this year. Together, we have a mission to accomplish. And one of the things that we get to contribute are the finances that God has blessed us with. So I want to challenge you. Be a contributor. Be somebody who is generous. But not just generous with your money. Be generous in your prayers for other people. Be generous in the grace and forgiveness that you give to other people. Because being in a family sometimes can get a little bit. You can fill in the blank with your own word. And much grace is required in giving towards someone else. Let's just be generous. Because there, there are going to be people in this room that you serve with, that you get, get to know, and you're like, I don't vote like them. I definitely don't post on social media like them, but I'm going to be gracious to them. I'm going to be generous with that. Rather than indignant and upset, frustrated, just, just be generous and gracious. Why? Because we're together, unified. As contributors, we get to be generous in that way. And then finally, last attribute, humble. Humble. Ephesians 4, verse 1. Therefore, therefore, I, a prisoner of prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Always. Whether you had your coffee or you haven't had coffee for 21 days, always be gentle and humble. When you're right, be humble. When you're wrong, be humble. When you have a disagreement, be humble. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making a full allowance for each other's faults because of your love. People around you, they're going to make mistakes. They're going to screw it up. I'm going to do things that aren't right. I'm going to mess some things up this year. You're going to mess some things up this year. Other people are going to mess some things up this year. They're going to say things the wrong way. They're not going to say hi to you when you come into church. They're going to get their coffee and not leave you. Any. There's going to be all sorts of reasons why you're going to be upset at somebody. Always be humble and gentle and make allowance for the faults that you know are going to happen. That's what being a family looks like. 
together. As a family. Together as a family. Being a part of a family is part of your spiritual formation. There are things that will be formed in you only in your spiritual walk, your, your faith. It will only be formed towards health when you make a commitment to not be an isolated piece, but be a connected piece. See, because when you start to contribute and decide, I'm going to go to a small group, you're going to get in a small group with people that you don't maybe like a whole lot. And you can try another small group if you want, but maybe that's the one God tells you to go into, and you're like, I don't know that I have anything in common with these people. They all are farmers, and I'm not. But we meet for coffee every Wednesday, and I love them. It's only when you get in a group with people and you're like, I don't know that I like everybody exactly the same. doesn't matter. They might rub you the wrong. So make an allowance. There's something that is formed when you commit to a relationship. There's something that is formed when I say, I'm going to be committed. I'm not going to allow other things to schedule me away from being with the people of God on Sunday. I'm going to clear my schedule to be with the people of God on Sunday because these are my people and I am a piece of the masterpiece that is being shed and talked about. So I'm going to be there. I'm going to commit. I'm going to open doors. I'm going to serve. I'm going to go through growth track. I'm going to give. There are some things that only can be formed in your spiritual life when you choose to be a contributor instead of a consumer. When you choose to contribute, engage, and be involved in a family. We're all being formed in some way. This isn't a perfect church. And if you think you find a perfect church, just don't attend it because you're going to mess up the trajectory. It's just not going to work for everybody. There's something that God wants to form and shape in your spiritual life this year that cannot be formed until you recognize that you're a piece of the masterpiece designed and fit together somewhere, somehow. Some of you need to take growth track. That's your next step. Learn what it means to be a partner and be, a, to be around and to serve and find your place. Find, find where you can serve in the team. When groups kick off, make a commitment. I'm going to join a connect group. 21 days of prayer. I'm going to be a part of it. Maybe you didn't start. You're like, oh, I missed a few days. So start today. It's okay. Do 14 days of prayer and fasting. That's better than zero days of prayer and fasting. Invite friends to come to church with you. Right? Like, be here. Make it a prayer. This is all things that we contribute to be a part of. We are together. And God has placed us together as a family in the house of God. It's in the church where I learned about forgiveness. It was being a part of a church family that I learned what it means to forgive when no one ever says I'm sorry. And they've abused you, taken advantage of you. It's in the church that I learned how to being committed to the family and the place God's called me to. It was in the family where I learned how to be authentic with my struggles and my weaknesses and my failures. It, it ought, it's the church where you ought to know is the safest place to ask for prayer when you're struggling with an addiction that's reared its head back up in your life for the fourth time. I don't care how many times you've said it today. Try again. Walk again. It, it, it's, it's in the church that I learned that when life and relationships aren't struggling, I can go to people and say, listen, I, I want to rip the heads off some people that I live with. Can you pray with me? It's in the church that I learned what it looks like to serve. It's in the church where I learned how to use my gifts. It's in the church where I learned how to tell my story. It's in the church where I learned. Why? Because there was a piece that God had made and crafted and made me unique. And I fit somewhere. And I never really discovered the value of that until I got in place. You don't know the value until you get in place. Would you stand? We're going to come to the Lord's table. Together. Every week. This is what we do. If you have the elements that you received on your way, go ahead and grab them. Go ahead and open them right now. You can grab the top layer, peel it back and get the wafer. And then the next layer has the juice. You can open that up as well. Hold on to it. We'll all partake together. Those at home, hopefully you've got something nearby you can use. We, we were all one side on the outside of this family, stuck in our sin, bound for hell. 
But by God's grace, he saved us. And he's placed us in a family together. This week, one of our elders shared with me an illustration as we were talking about this message. And they said, you know, it's interesting that a lot of people live this way in their spiritual life. They wake up Sundays. They get dressed as a family. They drive to someone's house. They knock on the door. They're invited in. And they show up because they know that there's a meal being served there. And they show up and they sit down at the table and they eat. They enjoy the food. It was cooked well. It was delicious. Clean house. They loved it. They say, hey, thanks so much. And they leave with a smile on their face, refreshed, strengthened. Ah, oh, that's good food. I love that. Next Sunday, they wake up. They get dressed. They drive to the same house because the food is going to be good. It's going to be amazing. They show up, knock on the door. Oh, hi. Yeah, yeah, come on, come on in. And they eat. They are filled. They're satisfied. They're like, that's good. I'm ready to go. It's going to be a great week. And they leave again. 30, 40, 50 times a year. Every Sunday, they do the same thing. Everyone's contributing. Everyone's participating. Everyone's adding value. We wouldn't do that in real life, would we? You wouldn't do that on a Sunday, show up at somebody's house and do it Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and not bring anything, not offer to help cook. Not a, we wouldn't do that. But many of us do that every Sunday. We call it attending church. Hear my heart. Faith Church is a house and a family where the door will always be open. The table will always be set. You don't have to contribute anything, and you can still show up and receive the bounty that the family provides. That's just the kind of house that we are. And some of you today, God is nudging you and tugging at your heart that now is the time. This is the season for you to say, you know what? I've received of the bounty enough. I'm ready to jump in and connect and not just be an isolated piece, but be a connected and engaged piece of what God is doing in this place. I'm going to be a contributor, unified, God-honoring, joyful, generous, humble contributor together on mission with this family that God has placed me in. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes? I want to thank you for your patience today as you've allowed me to kind of walk this through and a little bit longer than what's normal, but I believe the Lord is speaking to our hearts. And to be honest, it's a snowy day. Chiefs don't play till tonight. Ain't nobody got nothing else to do. Better is one day in the house of the Lord than anywhere else anyways. But I am grateful that you've stayed engaged and you've stayed connected. You've watched through the end. In this moment, would you just pause before the Lord and ask the Lord, Lord, what are you saying to me today? Maybe you recognize that you're not a part of the family of God and you haven't received the grace of God and you want to surrender your life and repent and say, Jesus, my life is yours. And that, that might be your prayer today. Jesus, my life is yours. And as simple as that. And your first step is going to be just taking this communion as a sign of your faith, believing that Jesus' body was broken, his blood was poured out for your forgiveness and your salvation. And you're going to receive his salvation today because you're taking these elements in faith, accepting and believing him as your Lord. Some of you today, maybe the Holy Spirit saying, you're a part of a family. I've placed you here. Now it's time to connect together and engage. Lord, whatever you're speaking to our hearts, give us the faith to obey. Lord, we, Lord, I acknowledge that sometimes I show up at church, even in my role of serving, as a self-serving thing. Sometimes I'm serving because it makes me feel better. But Lord, help me always have a renewed mind that says I'm serving because I'm helping to declare something that you are saying and doing among us. Lord, I'm not the whole puzzle. I'm just a piece of it. Lord, help us have this heart and mind as we come to your table today together. That night before Jesus was betrayed, he took some bread. He blessed it. And he says, this is my 
body, which is broken for you, every time you take this bread, do it remembering me. Can we remember that together as we partake? Then he lifted a cup. He blessed it. And he says, this wine represents my blood, which is poured out for your forgiveness of your sins. Every time you drink this cup, do it remembering that you have been forgiven, set right, placed in a family. Let's remember that together. Lord, today I pray a blessing over your people. Would you bless them and keep them? Would you be gracious to them? Would you lift your face towards them? Give them your peace. Would you lift your countenance, Lord, in their direction and grace them with your love. Everywhere we go this week, God, may we be radically reminded that we are loved by you and don't have to live in fear of that, of anything else, because we're loved by you. We pray these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And everybody said, amen. Listen. Hey, friends and family, I hope today's message was life-giving for you. I want to ask you to take a next step and go ahead and click the subscribe button so you never miss another chance to have an encounter with God. And while you're at it, take another step and share it with a friend. Maybe post it on your social network or text a coworker the link. And when you do that, you are partnering and get to be a part of seeing faith come to life in them. Hey, if Faith Church has made an impact in your life, if these messages are helping you gain traction in your faith, would you consider partnering with us financially? When you do that, it helps us widen our reach so that more people can have an encounter with the real Jesus. You can find information and ways to give on our central hub, faithchurchks.org. If, you're, if you live in the Southeast Kansas region, we'd love to see you in person at one of our Sunday services. You can find those times on our hub as well, faithchurchks.org. Hey, remember this, God is for you and we love you.